And so we arrive today to explore a very important relationship. The relationship and nexus between insecurity and assurance in life. How insecurity and assurance might affect life and indeed eternal life. So, how many of you are vertically challenged? That means you're short. Never mind, don't put up your hands. If you are insecure about your shortness, about your height, you might compensate it by, with he wearing high heels. If you are tall and insecure about your height, you might compensate it by walking around hunched or slouching, as a good number of people, tall people do. If you're insecure about your looks, you might wear heavy makeup from morning to night, so when you take it off at night, your husband doesn't recognize you. If you're insecure about your, if you, if you struggle for, uh, with vanity and good looks, I do not know what's the compensation here. Maybe have fewer mirrors in your house. If you're overweight, you may want to compensate the insecurity by loose clothing or changing from S to M to L. If you are overweight, you may want to compensate the insecurity. Uh, if you are underweight, sorry, you might want to remedy that by signing up for gym package after gym package to build up your body muscles. If you were an under, uh, underachiever in school, you might want to make up for it. How? By endless achievement in work and life. Is that why you're working so hard? To compensate for what you didn't achieve in school? If you are overachiever, you might want to come contemplate and compensate it by, dare I take a gap year? Dare I take a sabbatical? Dare I down my tools? If you are elderly, you may want to cover up your insecurity with anti-aging treatment and pills, which actually do not work. Sorry. <laughs> if you are a permanently unhappy person, you may want to camouflage it with temporary moments of happiness escaping into addictive, addictive pursuits like what? Gaming or worse still, pornography. And all of which adds up to, if you had some honesty, if we had some integrity, each of, and all of us, we are prone to being insecure beings in all the seasons of life, in all the stations of life. But here is the staggering truth about insecurity. Insecure people are danger firstly to ourselves and then to others, but first and foremost, an, an offence to God. What do you mean by that? Insecure kids may seek exploration of their identity, not in family. We should give them their identity, more and more so, their security. But insecure kids may seek the exploration of their identity where? In their peers and on the net. In the same way, insecure kids or teens may seek confirmation of their sexuality on social media. Insecure husbands, any insecure husbands here? Insecure husbands may seek the love language. What are husbands looking for? You may be looking for the love and the respect, and you may seek the love and the respect by verbal abuse, by mental abuse, and finally by physical abuse. Insecure wives, are there any insecure wives here? Let me just check. Insecure wives might be tempted to seek their emotional love language with a more sensitive man out there besides your husband. But you shouldn't be doing that. For the only man that you should be talking to is at home and falling in love with. Insecure elderly might seek to delay aging and postpone death with one last fling with a woman. It will be a last fling, you know why? Because it will fling them into poverty by being scammed by a woman who is not out for their good, but out for their money. They are the dangers of insecurity. If they are the dangers of insecurity, what are the assets and the benefits of assurance? And so in this conference, one of the speakers is sharing about a couple with a big heart in America. And Big Heart expressed in what way? They, they already had their own children. I don't know, more, much more than the average here, I guess four. But they also fostered and then adopted more kids. And so they had a reputation of that. And then somebody came up to them with a pair of twins. A pair of twins who really needed a permanent home because they had been in and out of foster homes eight times. But they said, no, we have too many children on our hands. 
But finally, through prayer and time, they took them in. The first night, they brought the twins back, right? After dinner, they put them in the room and they were expecting maybe some noise, some fights, some protests, but not a sound, not a squeak. And so it, they were curious. They opened the door, walked into that room, it was dark, and they found the kids, the twins, huddled in a corner. Doing what? Crying silently, crying on each other's shoulders and in each other's arms. Why? They found out in hindsight. Because in the previous homes they had been to, they were beaten and abused for merely crying of their loneliness. And so it confirmed in this couple's heart, big heart, to take them in, which they had done, and to love them as best as they could, and give them the greatest assurance sincerely and fully. And the outcome of that, the twins blossomed, grew into adults, and one became an Olympian, and the other became a well-known high school principal that brought a lot of love and assurance to people's hearts. Is there a difference between insecurity and assurance? You bet. For life and for eternal life. And so we ask ourselves, what might be distinctive or different about Christian insecurity and Christian assurance? What might be distinctive? And so, how might insecure Christians and churches be a danger to themselves and others? And ask the flip side questions, how might truly assured Christians and churches be a blessing to themselves and blessing to others for the service and the glory of God? And this is what we want to explore here. And in Romans, as Paul writes these 16 chapters, it would seem that he highlights two insecurities. And the two insecurities seem to be the first one. So I find in chapter 7, verse 1, uh, 21 24, Paul writes this. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, where in my inner being, he speaks of the inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me a captive to the law of sin and dwells, that dwells in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And so his first insecurity comes from his failure with sin, his failure because of sin, and failure with sin and failure because of sin in his wrestling and struggle with sin in his life and your life might shake and rattle what? Our confidence in being saved by grace and grace alone and Christ and Christ alone, by faith and faith alone. I struggle with sin. You struggle with sin. It's hidden, but it's there in our hearts and our lives. That is the first insecurity. His second insecurity is this. His second insecurity. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword the second insecurity is failure when we suffer. Failure when we suffer can unsettle and shake and rattle our faith in God, this salvation that is by grace in Christ and Christ alone. And so if that is true, that in 16 chapters, Paul paints for us, these are the two insecurities that might come upon your life and my life. Yes, we believe in being saved by faith alone, justified by faith, by grace but what if I fail in my struggle with sin? What if I fail when I suffer and I give up along the way? Will I arrive on the other side? Will I truly take part in the promises of God fulfilled in Christ? So here is a possible outline. And a possible outline, the assurance of no condemnation when we struggle with sin. And then he moves on, assurance of sure suffering, but the sure suffering is overcome by the surer presence and power of the Holy Spirit, whom God sends into your life and my life as a result of faith in Christ Jesus. And the final portion, assurance of no separation, no separation from the love of God in Christ Jesus, no matter what the suffering, no matter what the accusations. This and this alone will compensate for all the insecurities. And so a little bit of context is very important, or significant insights to the context is very important to understand this. When this was written, most likely in late 50s, AD 57, AD 60, 
Romans. In AD 49, the emperor of that time, Emperor Claudius, had done what? He marched out and exiled the Jews and the Jewish Christians from Rome. And why did he exile them from Rome? You know what that means? That means the government of the day, example here, has highlighted some troublemakers here in, in Singapore, a particular race. Is it the Chinese race? Is it the Indian race? Is it the Malay race? Or oh, different people that are here, we march you out, which means you get this edict and tomorrow you leave your HDB flat. You leave your jobs. You go to a whole new place. What do you call that? Insecurity of the highest order. And human history have had that. And in Southeast Asia, that's what Pol Pot did in Cambodia. He marched out his people and two million of them died in the genocide because he be believed in beginning with ground zero. If I got rid of all those who oppose communism, we might start afresh with a whole new humanity. And so he marched them out, the Jews, and especially I think the Jewish Christians, for being troublemakers over the name of this person they believe in, Christos, Christ. But years later, a new emperor reversed that edict and allowed them to return. And so they returned in drips and draps. As they returned to drips and draps, the churches that were in existence then were all house churches. House churches made up of, can you tell me? Two main races. House churches made up of mainly Jews and Gentiles. If the emperor had marched out the Jews, the church became mainly Gentile for a few years. And when the Jews came back into the house church, can you imagine the tensions? Can you imagine the conflicts? The distrust of Jews for Gentiles. We, never, we knew we could never trust you. And now they sit there as the redeemed people of God called to the great commandment to love each other and the great commission to be a shining light to the world. So insecurity was thick in the air, like smoke from a forest fire, like smoke from gas emissions. It started to pollute what? It started to pollute social harmony. It started to blur racial, racial perspectives. It started to poison political narratives. And the empress were nervous about what? The empress were nervous about the low-grade grumbling in different sectors of the population. And the low-grade grumbling could ball over into open revolt at any time in the Roman Empire. And then there were racial ghettos, tribal hardest, were insecure with this Roman emperor and his, and his values, which will be the recipients of his favor, favor and which will be the recipients of his disfavor. And isn't that what we are going through with this national discourse? Who will come up more blessed by the government's policy on this or that? Who will benefit more? And all that causes securities or insecurities, tensions and conflict within the population. I just want to check, is the light, are the lights a little bit dim? It's slightly dim because I can see you becoming dimmer. I mean, can, is it on at 100%? Yep, let's try that. Okay, sorry. Into this externally strong-looking empire, but internally fragile hodgepodge, Paul the Apostle, under God's instructions, write with two main goals. His first goal is to bring about, is to heal the love and the unity between Jews and Gentiles in God's church. And you find it in what? Him bringing about unity? between Jews and Gentiles, from Romans 1 verse 16, you know, for many years before we put up this new building and had this new verses put up here, the slogan that we put in our church building here, we have no sign of the cross, no cross here, but only the words of Scripture, which is more important, right? And it was Romans 1 16, that we are not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because the power of God for salvation, and you can finish that, those who, who know this better, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because why? is the power of God for salvation, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. And then he will go on in Romans 9 to 11, for three chapters out of 16 chapters, he goes to great lengths to explain the glorious relationship between Jews and Gentiles, that in God's salvation plan, it was the priority of the Jews. Yes, Abraham got the promise first, but the fulfillment of that was the calling and the finality of the Gentiles. And the priority of the Jews and finality of Gentiles led to the totality of the church. But his focus in 9 to 11, Romans 9 to 11, was not simply the totality of the church, but the unity of the church. That you who are Gentiles 
must not think yourself superior to the Jews. Your Roman emperor has just thrown them out. But you must not, because you are the branches that came from the roots, which are the Jews. So he's pleading with all of his heart for the unity of Jew and Gentile. And secondly, he writes this so that they will become a missionary force, not simply for their unity, a missionary force to an insecure world under insecure emperors and empires. And so he will say in Romans 12, 17, bless those who persecute you. That's your missionary force. If they persecute you, you bless them in return. In Romans 13, he will say, obey your authorities, obey your authorities. Can you imagine a Jewish Christian sitting there in a house church? Obey the authorities and be exiled. Obey your authorities and be left behind. Obey the authorities. And how do you obey your authorities? You'll tell them in Romans 13, you'll pay that tax. You pay that very unpopular tax. And that's how it works out. And so with that, Romans 8 that we just read is instrumental to Paul's dual purpose of unity and God's missionary force for the glory of God. And so here he deals with two insecurities. And what his, are his, the two insecurities? No matter what your struggles are, with sin, no matter what your struggles are with suffering, there'll be no condemnation for you. There'll be no separation for you. Do you believe that? That's the only way to overcome your insecurities. It was Easter 1970. 1970. How many of you were born after 1970? Hands up. In Bishan, I can see you through the camera. Born after 1970. Former Deputy Prime Minister of Australia, John Anderson, was 14 years old then. He was studying in university in Sydney, uh, studying in a boarding school in Sydney. He went home for school holiday. He was playing cricket in the front of his family property in northern New South Wales. And what was he playing with his father? A game of cricket. That's what all Australian men play. And so his father was bowling and he was batting his father was bowling, he was betting, and you play games of any time, of any kind, whether you're hitting a shuttlecock, whether you're hitting a tennis ball, whether you're hitting a cricket ball, you know when you hit it perfectly. There's a sound to you when you hit, when you strike something perfectly in sports. And so the father bowled and he whacked it, and he knew he had whacked it. And it was a sixer. A sixer in cricket means you get six runs for that. It's over the boundary. He whacked it. And his younger sister, who was sitting on the porch playing with a cat called General Smuts, the ball hit her on the back and killed her straight away. How do you think John Anderson lived for the rest of his life? That was 1970, Easter 1970. It took him 40, 50 years before he could actually speak about it and turn this tragedy in his life to be a blessing. And today, over the past X number of years, he has hosted a podcast with the biggest names, getting them to think about family values in a very liberal Australia. Therefore, there is no condemnation for us in Christ Jesus. Could he download that? Could he appropriate them? There is no condemnation. Can you please tell me, oh God, that that wasn't an accident? that I struck the ball and I killed my sister in an instant. When you struggle with sins of commission or sins of omission, was that a sin of omission? I do not know. He doesn't know. It happened. Your whole security is rocked, rattled, and shaken. And that's why this verse is mighty. And why is it mighty? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from what? From the law of sin and death. For what? For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. By sending His own Son into the likeness, in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, He condemns sin in the flesh. Why? In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. 
given by Christ Jesus and the Father. So what is Paul doing here? He's done seven chapters of what? He recalls his own spiritual journey, and his own spiritual journey comes to a climax in Romans 7 and Romans 8. And this is a picture and representation of either false security in self-redemption, the law, or true security in Jesus, the law fulfiller. As a Jew, he knew that he had God's law. As a Jew, he also knew that God's law was good. As a Jew, he should have also factored in that in, in response to God's law, we have the DNA of Adam, the DNA of sin. So when you put together sin plus law, sin plus law equals what? Sin plus law, according to Paul, equals spiritual death. But if we put together sin plus the law keeper, Jesus, it means eternal life. That's how you become justified by faith. And so you try this, it's very important. And God, and Paul goes on to explain this. If you link yourself and marry yourself to the wrong thing, you marry yourself to law and any effort at self-rescue, your own morality, your own piety, your own purity, your own charity, the things you're trying to do to look good to men and look good to God, all that self-rescue will fail. But if you marry yourself to Jesus, the law fulfiller, and to the Spirit of God that He puts in you, it will bring life and eternal life. So you know as a congregation here in New York, PC, I love movies. And when did my love for movies start? I do not know because I was born into a family when my father was the owner of a cinema. And he had this cinema in the 1950s before I was born. From as young as I could remember, I was, I love movies because I could watch any movie in Malay, Tamil, Chinese, or English, right? I learned the importance and goodness of knowing the right person and the right name. You know why? Every time I walk to my cinema, right, I just have to mention my father and I get in. That's why I knew. You mentioned the right name, then after a while they recognize you. Uh, this is the Taoke san, right? Cinema Taoke san. But that privilege did not start and stop there because my dad's cinema was part of the Cathay franchise, Cathay Cinema franchise at that time, the chain of cinemas. So I found that in growing up to be a teenager, wherever I went, Malacca, closest to me, Suramban, further from me, Kuala Lumpur, and even Singapore, anywhere I went, I just mentioned my father's name and mentioned my cinema. They would check the list, make a phone call, and no questions asked, I'll get a seat. I love linking my name to my father's name for movies. I was always secure. His name never failed to open the doors. You get the point I'm making? You link yourself to anything else, any other activity. You link yourself to any other thing to get right with God. It is fatal. It is deluded assurance. It is no assurance at all. You link yourself by faith to Jesus Christ. You call upon His name and depend on Him moment by moment, day by day, and you will experience the wonder of this, the wow of this. And so, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. How do you think Paul would want us to read this? Read this aloud. There is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. No. There is now no condemnation. There is a wow factor there. There's a wonderment factor. There's an amazing factor. I struggle with so much sin in thought and word and deed that actually should condemn me. I struggle with this. But wow, wonderment, amazement to Christ. I'm pronounced justified. I'm pronounced a child of God. And so someone, really, someone said helpfully, by His death, Jesus fulfills the law for us. But by His Spirit who comes to dwell in us as a first deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance, Jesus fulfills the law in us. The Spirit lives within you. And as we read in Colossians 1 last week, if you read it and did Bible study on it, you are now to live a life that is worthy of Him, pleasing Him in every good work, bearing fruit in everything. You now wake up as a Jesus believer and follower, as a Spirit-filled person, asking the question, not how can I be pleased today? How can I please you today? That's vitally important. And another quote, no one benefits from the cross without the Spirit. 
if the Spirit of God is not in you, you will not wow and be amazed by Jesus in the cross. And no one receives the Spirit without the continued amazement of Jesus and the cross for us. So two things in application of no condemnation. If you are an atheist, which means you have convinced yourself there is no such person called God and there is no such concept called sin, if you convince yourself by listening to this world in an echo chamber, whatever you're on listening to, I so happen to chance upon a YouTube video of, an, of Atis, and his whole purpose was to walk through every book of the Bible to find holes all the way from Genesis to Revelation. I listened to his expose of, Je of Genesis, and after a while I said, this man is in deep trouble. All he does is he mocks at God and mocks God. Could God have created everything in a 24-hour day? My goodness. Just because you can't comprehend the magnificence of God creating things in seven days doesn't mean he can't create it. Not pitiful God, but pitiful man. you got too small a brain to wrap your mind around the mega brain of God. And because of your minute brain, you think God doesn't exist? And because God doesn't exist then sin doesn't exist. If God doesn't exist and sin doesn't exist, you will never have the wow moment. There is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Because you don't live condemned. Whatever you want to do with your mind, whatever sins you want to think of, whatever sins you want to do with your eyes, you do. And just because you think and I think there is no such thing called sin doesn't mean there is no such thing called sin and no wrath for that sin. There is, but more preciously for us, for us as Christians, is us calling upon the name of the Lord a Sunday experience or Monday to Saturday experience as well. If the only time you call on the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus is Sunday, and actually, think about it, right? I'm just going to pause and slow this down a little bit. It's not you mentioning the name of Jesus is the service leader and the singers and the preacher who have mentioned Jesus' name on your behalf. If you haven't personally called upon the name of the Lord Jesus, there is no wow factor. There is no wow factor. There is no, there is no amazement of, there is no condemnation. That means throughout the week, as you struggle with anger against each other, husband and wife, as you struggle with unkind thoughts against your father or mother, as you struggle with unkind and unloving words towards each other, you never needed to confess this, oh wretched man that I am, how could I think that thought of my father? How could I speak that unloving word to my wife and my son and my daughter? How could I do that unloving thing to each other? If you don't ever see the depravity of your sin, you will never see the glory of Jesus. And if you only ever think of Jesus and mention Him, and I say again, it is not you mentioning Him, it is us mentioning Him on your behalf. You must question whether you are just a Christian atheist. Christian by name, but atheist at heart, because you never felt the depth of your struggle with sin and the wonderment of your justification and salvation in Christ. Hey, may you experience this more and more the depth of your sin and the height of your salvation in Jesus. That's so important. And the calling upon Jesus' name is not a Sunday weekend phenomena. It's not a DG once a week, twice a week phenomena. It's a moment by moment presence of the Lord with you and with, for you and for me. That brings assurance. There is no condemnation. Now Paul moves from no condemnation to assurance of sure suffering. And where's the assurance of sure suffering? For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. And so he says, a sure thing, if you believe in Jesus, you are surely going to suffer. Imagine saying this at discovering Christianity. Imagine saying this as you evangelize somebody. This is totally to the, different to prosperity gospel. You believe in Jesus, I promise you, you have more troubles after this than before this. That's the authentic gospel. Not for better, for, is for better, for worse. 
Not for better, for best. It's for better, for worse. That's involved in following Jesus. Come and die with Him. But then His main point in this portion is, the main point is, the sufferings are there. Here are the sufferings. They feel so heavy and feel so weighty while we are suffering them. But the glories in the future will outweigh the present sufferings. The future glory will outweigh the present sufferings. And then he goes and speaks about this in terms of three groanings. Creation groans, we as the sons and daughters groan, and then finally the Spirit of God groans. And this groaning is to take us from present suffering to future glory. This part is complex. But let me just read it to you. What on earth does he mean by this? For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, we ourselves, the sons, the adopted sons, the children, the heirs, the co-heirs with Christ, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. And so, a writer calls this, this whole portion is a series of groans. So as a Christian, you embark on this journey and you embark on a series of groans, a symphony of sighs, and it traces the history of us and God. And so the first groaning, creation groans. And when creation groans, creation is groaning and basically saying, this is awful. What is awful? Living in sin and finally dying. Born only to grow up, grow old and die. So I want to ask everybody here, the 500 people here, the 500 people at, at Bishan, all 500 of us are on the same pilgrimage. You're born into this world. You will, by the grace of God, grow up. You will grow old and then die. Is that God's purpose for you? His grand purpose is to bring you into the world, grow up, grow old, get wrinkly, and then die. Surely not. Creation groans and says, this way, when we rule ourselves, we live in sin and death. This is awful. And then sons and daughters groan. Sons and daughters groan. This is hopeful. And why is it hopeful? Because we are longing for the redemption of our bodies. Creation groans that the children of God will rule the world. And then we groan and we say when we rule the world under Christ, the end goal of this is not grow up, grow old, die, but redemption of our bodies. That though we die, we will rise to eternal life. And then the spirit groans. And this, this portion is so full of the spirit. Not this is just awful, this is just hopeful, but so full of God. This is God's Spirit praying to God with wordless prayers, prayers without words. And what does the Spirit of God pray on God's people suffering here on earth from our present sufferings to God? He prays according to the will of God. So if the flawed and incomplete word prayers of God's people are heard and answered, how much more will be the full and complete wordless prayers of the Spirit of God who knows the perfect will of God in an imperfect world and prays that we will arrive at that glory. So there's Christopher Nolan, the film director. There's also Christopher Nolan, quite well known in the UK for what? He suffered cerebral palsy from experiencing oxygen de deprivation during birth. And how badly was he affected? Cerebral palsy. No control of any part of his body. But his parents were intent to do what? His parents were intent to treat him as normally. As normally means they related to him as normally, they sang to him, they played with him, and the mother especially started to read to him. And one day while reading to him, she looked into his eyes. He could not speak, right? He could not move. One day in reading to him, she saw in his eyes a, a hope, a bright light that she never saw in him until that point. And she knew something was unlocked by hearing the reading of that book, just the reading. And so, you know, between the son and the mother, not a word was spoken because he couldn't speak. 
But everything he communicated with his eyes, word, wordless, without words, was fully understood by his mother who loved him. And so what was communicated is, in my deepest, my deepest cries and my deepest longing, I'm several, su suffering from cerebral palsy. Yet, as you read to me, that's the thing that makes me alive. Not a word was spoken from his desperate cries. And yet his mother understood that and helped him achieve his highest goals. And what was his highest goal? From that point onwards, he learned to write. And he could write 30 minutes per word, right? Over 10 years. And he wrote this book called Eye of the Clock that won him the Whitbread Prize for Literature. And he produced three other books. That's a limited illustration. I can't really explain this to the full. But when we pray as we suffer, this is what happens. What happens? For those God knew, for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who call according to His promise, for those who He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those He justified, He also glorified. What do you mean by this? Just look at that last verse, right? And in John Stott's words, in his commentary, he says, in one verse with five words, Paul takes us from eternity past, those God foreknew. This doesn't mean the prior knowledge of God, but the prior choice of God in choosing Abraham and choosing Israel and then finally Jesus and the new Israel. Those he foreknew, he also predestined. And those he predestined, he also justified. From eternity past to eternity present, you would experience the justification of God when? In your life, in the present, right? And then you will experience being glorified in eternity future. When you read this one verse and grasp it, God working together for good, for those who love Him and those He call, not for everybody's good, for those who call and those who love Him in return. Our salvation is watertight. From eternity past to eternity present, full of sufferings to eternity future, full of God's glory. You know what that means? They say in church, right? The front door is very wide. Many people may come to join us here at ORPC, ARPC, Princep Street, whichever church. But the side doors and the back doors are very wide. That's from a human level. But from God's perspective in Romans 8, verse 30, verse 30 right? From eternity past to eternity future, experience in eternity presence of our sufferings. There are no side doors, there are no back doors. There are no dropouts. Every child that goes from Sunday school to basic will carry on into adulthood. There are no attrition rates from God's perspective from childhood to youth to adulthood to our elderly years. That's an amazing thing. No matter what the sufferings come upon your life, for those God foreknew, He also predestined. And those He predestined, He also called. And those He called, He justified. And those He justified, He also glorified. By His sacrificial death and victorious resurrection, by the presence of His Holy Spirit, this is a done thing. Notice the tense of that glorified is past tense. Not He will glorify. He glorified. There are no dropouts and no attrition rates in the invisible church of Jesus Christ. In the visible church, there are. You always have to cull your membership. But in the invisible church, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. So I conducted a funeral for Mona's nephew, young nephew. He was 16 years old. He was fit. He was a sports person in his life. He, was, he so loved soccer. He so loved men, Manchester United. He was chosen for a clinic at Man U in the UK. And then he came down with a ferocious brain tumour. A ferocious brain tumour that would not go away, no matter how much his parents sought the best treatment around the world. And Johnson died two years after the discovery of that cancer. And so understandably, there were many broken hearts and uncontrollable tears at his funeral in Kiel. I conducted the funeral. And I remember sitting physically and emotionally drained after that funeral, as you would be 
the funeral of a young man, of a baby, of a child. It drains you. I noticed a young boy hovering around when I was sitting at the table, having a drink and light refreshments. And I could see in his eyes that he was, he was tearing up, that he was badly affected. So I said, you okay? And I said, Pastor Chris, I'm Chris. I'm Jonathan's friend. I said, yeah, I sort of realized. I just wanted to ask you. I said, yeah, please do. I just wanted to know, is Jonathan really in heaven? How can we be sure? When a boy comes up to you and asks that question, what's he looking for? At the death of his good friend at 16 years old, what's he looking for? He's looking for assurance of whether this person that you talk about, Jesus, is true, or whether this faith that there is no condemnation, that there is no separation for those of us who love Christ is true. And what do you think I said? Because I'm a trained pastor, yes, of course it's true. You better believe it. Everything within me asks myself first, in a moment, do I believe this? Am I going to say a false thing to him? I don't even know whether I feel this to be true. I said, all that God promises us is true though we may not feel it's true. When we and our loved ones suffer and finally die, we will all understandably ask this question. And what is the question? Is God for me or against me? His answer is, if God is for us, God is on our side, who can be against us? Who can outweigh God in our lives? And who can outweigh the glories of God in the end? All the sufferings in this world are lightweight compared to the overweight of God's glory in the end when we have the redemption of our bodies. That's what he's on view here. And that's so important. Whatever life throws at us, whatever Satan and sin throws at us, choose Jesus. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. Amen? And then as you say that, what I said to this young boy, a fellow 16-year-old, you know how they began that funeral? They began the funeral by young boys, right, who played sport by doing the New Zealand haka. Just trying to be brave in the face of death. And then as they see him go in and burn in the flames, all that human bravery disappears. What bravery can you throw in the face of death? How many tears can you throw in the face of death? that will quench the fires that will consume your body. Nothing. So you must say to people, yes, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. And you ask, isn't it a little bit unreal? Isn't it a little bit insensitive when people, when Christians are suffering or hurting or crying or dying to say that? Isn't it a bit insensible? How can we be so hopeful when we are suffering so much? And that's why Paul says, if you link yourself to Jesus and link yourself to the Spirit, you need the Spirit of God for suffering. For the Spirit's work is not to harden you to insensitivity of suffering. The Spirit's work is not to deaden you to insensibility when things happen to God's people. The Spirit's work is to soften you to God's sovereignty by getting you to look at Jesus that no matter how dampened your spirits are, no matter how tempted you are to be hardened and to be hardened by your circumstances, you look upon God's sovereignty in Christ and your heart is softened once again. No matter what Satan and sin throws at us, you choose Jesus. Amen. And so I was privileged to go to this sing conference with the Gettys and just arrived back yesterday after the 30-hour flight. So if I'm a little bit incoherent today, please forgive me. And so it was my great honor and joy to meet Joni Erickson Tada. And Joni Erickson Tada, for those of us who are younger, may not know her. But as a young Christian, I became a Christian about 40 over years ago. One of the first books I read was her testimony. And to meet her in the flesh, and we we're going to show this and end our time together. Just a few weeks after high school graduation, 
as I was preparing to head off to college, my sister Kathy invited me to go to the beach for a swim. I swam out to this raft, athlete that I was, I didn't even touch bottom, hoisted myself up onto it and then took this really stupid dive into what ended up being extremely shallow water. I snapped my head back when I hit bottom and it crunched my fourth cervical vertebrae, severing my spinal cord. There I was lying face down in the water, desperately hoping that my sister Kathy would please notice that I had not surfaced from my dive. Unbeknownst to me, her back was turned to me. She didn't even see me take that dive, but a crab bit her toe. And it so startled her that she quick turned around in the water screamed to me, Johnny, watch out for crabs. And when she did, she saw my blonde hair floating on the surface. I was face down, ready to drown. She came swimming quickly, pulled me up out of the water. And I never, I never was so grateful for fresh air. She saved me, but for what purpose, for what reason? Because now, lying there in a hospital, doctors told me I was going to have to sit down for the rest of my life as a quadriplegic without use of my legs or, or even my hands. My hands don't work. And I remember thinking, God, is this, is this your idea of an answer to a prayer to be drawn closer to you? If it is, you're never gonna be trusted with another one of my prayers again. I mean, I'm a new Christian. How could you have taken me so seriously? I sank into deep depression. I, I remember there were wonderful Christian friends who came to the hospital and they encouraged me. And one Bible verse they shared was from Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, where God says, I know the plans I have for you, plans not to harm you, but to help you, plans to prosper you and to give you a hopeful future. God, you, you mean you plan not to harm me? Well, what do you call quadriplegia, huh? What's that all about? As I read that verse and the context around it, I realized something, that when God said that, he was saying it to his children who were being dragged away into captivity by, by the Babylonians. They were going to exile, they were going into slavery. They had decades in front of them of hard, awful suffering. And I began to see that God's plans for a hopeful future for me was not necessarily jumping up, dancing, kicking, doing aerobics, running, walking, getting back use of my arms and my legs. No, God's plans for me go far deeper, a deeper healing, a precious healing of the soul. Because as I was pushed into the arms of God every morning, and that's the truth, even to this day, don't be thinking I'm an expert at quadriplegia. But as it was then in the hospital and as it is today, every morning I wake up saying, Jesus, I can't do this thing called life. Please help me. Please show up, give me your smile, give me your strength because I can't make it through the day. And because I go to God with that earnest dependency and, and requirement of his grace every single day, I take that back, no, every single moment, I experience the sweetest, most precious, most intimate union with Jesus Christ. So in Jeremiah 29, when God says he won't harm us, doesn't mean the body, doesn't mean our circumstances. He's not gonna do anything to harm our soul. Yes, our body may get harmed, but it will somehow serve to enrich our soul. In closing, let me just say that quadriplegia 46 years of it, that's a long time. I deal with chronic pain. I, um, I had breast cancer a couple of years ago, and I remember, I remember as my husband was driving me home in the van from chemotherapy one day, we were talking about how suffering is like little splashovers of hell, kind of like waking us up out of our spiritual slumber. And then we, we pulled in the driveway and he said, well, then what do you think splashovers of heaven are? Are they those easy, breezy, bright times where everything's going your way, where you have health? And we said, no. Splashovers of heaven are finding Jesus in your splashover of hell. And to find Jesus in your hell is ecstasy beyond compare. And I wouldn't trade it for any amount of walking in this world.
Joni prayed a prayer to get closer to God, and God's answer to her was 46 years of paraplegia and then breast cancer. And do you hear that line? Jesus, I can't do this thing called life anymore. And into that moment of desperation, her life shot to bits, her body shot to bits, as it were. So many holes in her life, so many holes in her body, the light of Jesus shines through. There were many big names at the conference, but in just your brief encounter with Joni, in our brief encounter, I unashamedly moaned to myself, Joni, can we take a picture with you? <laughs> so in heaven, we'll be together. In that brief moments with her, you see more Jesus than at any time with any persons. So we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. Those who are called according to His purpose, for those God foreknew, He also glorified. It is a done thing. Insecurity brings great harm to ourselves and to others. Great offence to God as we try to embark on self-rescue. But assurance in Christ, no condemnation, no matter what my struggles or failures with sin. Assurance of sure suffering and the sure presence of the Holy Spirit. And assurance of no separation, no matter what the sufferings. We will be a great blessing to others and bring great glory to God. With that we know, there are no unanswered prayers. Let's stand, rise, pray and trust in God. Bow for a moment of quiet reflection. Humble, sober reflection. We must thank you and praise you for your word. We must thank you and praise you evermore for your Son and all the blessings that we have in Christ. We come confessing that left to ourselves without you, we are all insecure people a harm to ourselves, a danger to others, an offence to you, trying to make up for our insecurities by our self-redemptions and self-effort and self-achievements. But we thank you for your great antidote, your great salvation in Christ and Christ alone, Heavenly Father, that in Him we have true assurance. There is now no more condemnation for all of us in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. There is great assurance in Jesus that there, all who are in Christ will not, will not be separated from you, no matter what the sufferings, no matter what the accusations. We pray that in hearing your word, we'll be the most confident and assured people, a blessing to ourselves, a blessing to others, and glory to your name as you bring the great commission to our family and friends. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.